I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program entitled Music as Medicine, How 21st Century Physicians Can Apply Music in Comprehensive Patient Care. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at UVA School of Medicine, and we're happy to produce and bring these programs to you every week during the academic year. <coughs> um, as many of you know, our program last week visited an intersection between music and medicine in the life and work of 20th century English composer Herbert Howells, who lost a young son to polio in the summer of 1935. Howells poured his grief into his music, composing pieces in memory of Michael. And so we might say that, metaphorically speaking at least, music was medicine for this bereaved father. Today we turn more fully to the idea of music as medicine, a concept and practice that dates back millennia and crosses all cultures. In our own tradition of Western thought and Western medicine, we might recall the ancient Greek healing center at Epidaurus, where music was an integral therapeutic modality. And of course, there is Hippocrates, who as a practitioner counted music among his tools for addressing human illnesses and disorders. Today, music is everywhere in our busy world, and nearly everyone's activities seem accompanied by a personal recorded soundtrack. But what about music and medicine? We sell ourselves short, I think, if we consider the bland tunes piped into waiting rooms mere distractions, or the country music crooning in an OR, just a way to calm the surgical team. What actually is therapeutic about music? Are there evidence-based possibilities for music as medicine? How might music figure today in comprehensive clinical care, from the waiting room to the recovery room? How does music affect patients, but also professionals? And does it matter what kind of music is used in different clinical situations? How might clinicians guide their patients to use music on their own in therapeutic ways? Indeed, given the ubiquity and affordability of recorded music today, might music represent a cost-effective way to help us improve health care and the health status of all of us? So to explore these questions with us all in an hour, uh, we welcome musicologist April Green who has a special interest in the ways that 21st century health professionals might gain tools for healing by purposefully employing music in patient care. Professor Greenan is on the faculty of the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg. She's an accomplished musician as well as a scholar. What she doesn't have is any financial conflict of interest to declare. Um, but right now, I will turn her over to you um, for an hour in which I think we'll learn a little bit about taking care of each other through music. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Childress. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, and in a way, I could just say yes to everything that Dr. Childress just posed by way of questions and sit down. Uh, she, she posed the salient questions, at least those that I'm interested in, having to do with how music can be used as medicine. And uh, so thank you for introducing those questions. Uh, on January 8th, 2011, a gunman opened fire at a community gathering outside a suburban grocery store in Arizona. In the carnage, six people were killed, 19 injured, and the intended target of the attack, United States Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, sustained severe brain injuries, as you may recall. Within hours, surgeons had removed skull fragments and necrotic tissue from her brain. And over the following months, the nation was riveted as we witnessed her astonishing recovery. Her medical team employed music in order to rebuild the linguistic functions of her brain. Let's have a view at uh, at least one of the dramatic moments that shows a bit of music's curative powers.
special message to our constituents. Representing Arizona is my honor. A transformation that began nine months ago when she could barely respond. Can you smile, sweetie? Oh, well, that's not... <laughs> because she was injured in the left side of the brain, where speech is controlled, her words had abandoned her. What's the matter? Yes. In this emotionally charged moment, she sang the words she couldn't speak, a key to her amazing recovery. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Excellent. Language is normally held in the left hemisphere of the brain, where Gabby was injured. Music exists in both hemispheres. Incredibly, scientists are finding that music therapy can rebuild language on the uninjured right side. Nothing activates the brain so extensively as music. This application of music as medicine and the validation of such therapy by prominent neuroscientists such as Dr. Oliver Sacks at Columbia especially resonate with me as a musicologist. I have an intense interest in the historical as well as potential uses of music as medicine. Uh, there were uh, several other instances in which Gabby Giffords used music as a way of overcoming her difficulty in recovering her speech. And I chose just the one that I showed you uh, this was her first and longest communication <clears throat> excuse me, with her music therapist. She had had extreme difficulty um, just pronouncing words such as watch and spoon, and she kept using the word chicken for just about every other word her therapist wanted her to say for a period of, of a couple of days. That was the word that came to her. And finally, <clears throat> when a music therapist was called in, she began to sing. And she sang, girls just want to have fun, and free falling, and, and some other songs. After she had sung, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And uh, she and her husband have commented on the powerful effect music had on her psychologically, emotionally, and, and as you see, physically, in, in restoring her language. So music has been used in the treatment of people who have suffered uh, from stroke. Uh, my own sister is an, an example, and who have lost the ability to speak and read. And uh, music has been used in therapeutic applications such that people are comforted and uh, soothed, as we uh, heard Dr. Childress uh, mention with regard to Herbert Howells, the composer. I imagine that each of you has used music therapeutically in your own life. And if you'll give that thought for just a moment, <clears throat> think about uh, primarily when you're sad. I think it's interesting that most people listen to sad music when they're sad. We want to be more sad, and we want to experience that sadness, and music helps us do that. But you also use music to be happy, and I often enjoy watching people at concerts, especially, um, uh, I dare say, non-classical concerts, when an audience can be a little more demonstrative of their enjoyment. And, and I see how people are using that music as therapy for themselves. They set aside time in their schedules, they spend money on a ticket, they make whatever arrangements they need to make in order to hear music that they enjoy. And that's a significant action, given our world and the busy lives that we lead, for people to set aside time simply to enjoy music. It's being therapeutic in, in that practice. I imagine many of you uh, use music as you exercise, and music can help you uh, keep or sustain energy and uh, sometimes uh, cleaning the house to music <clears throat> is a good idea. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, uh, and so a, a tip 
uh, for drudgery tasks is to listen to music in particular kinds that I'll mention in a few minutes that can help you stay motivated and active and yet those kinds of music under other circumstances would be not favorable. And uh, so part of my message today is that we need to be mindful of the types of music that we use in certain applications and even in our own lives. Music today is uh, being, treat, being used to treat patients with cancer, Alzheimer's disease, depression, dementia, even dyslexia. And uh, the list goes on in terms of conditions that music is uh, finding application for. Um, uh, you might be surprised to know that music is being used not as uh, just a, a matter of the patient hearing the music and being calmed by it, but the music has different effects. That is to say, uh, the neural responses to particular types of music are then affecting the functions of the body. And so we are seeing that music really is acting as medicine. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, the research and, and pedagogy that illuminate how healthcare professionals, such as many of you here today, can, uh, uh, the, the research that will illuminate how you can elevate your patient's care, treatment outcomes, by drawing upon the power of music. And in discussing music today, I'll uh, give you a, a bit of a definition. Uh, I will consider any sound as a fair game for being classified as music. Indeed, any sound can be musical. The extent to which it is musical is simply a matter of opinion. But sound is what constitutes music. And I don't know if you have ever thought to define music. We all know what it is. We all use it extensively in our lives. And I imagine each of us has already heard some music today. And yet, I don't know if you've ever thought of how you would explain what music is to someone else. The definition uh, by the 20th century composer Edgar Juarez is a really good one that I like. And he just said that music is organized sound. And so with that as a basis uh, for addressing music as medicine, that we're talking about organized sound, uh, then I want to proceed with a, a bit of an informal survey, if you'll join me in this. Uh, with those of you who uh, are active musicians today. You play an instrument or sing relatively frequently and, and you're engaged fairly actively in music. Would you raise your hands? And would you look around the room? <laughs> uh, this is something that I expected to see, so thank you for cooperating with that. <laughs> Uh, it is uh, very often that we find people in medical professions uh, engaged closely with music. Uh, many people who have served on admissions boards of medical schools have commented on the favorability of an applicant who demonstrates activity in music. Uh, a student who has been active in music shows, of course, self-discipline, the ability to uh, juggle a very full schedule because Music requires practice every day, devoted hours of practice every day. And yet there are more features that accompany um, uh, active engagement in music. And today's technology shows us that active musicians actually have areas of the brain that function more efficiently and on a, 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 in a, a better way, to use sort of a casual phrase there, than uh, people who are not actively engaged in music. So for those of you who didn't raise your hands, if you would wish to run out and sign up for some music lessons, it, it would be wonderful for you and it would be wonderful for all of us. That said, how many of you did have music lessons growing up or some type of activity in music? You played an instrument or sang in a choir. 
and you might want to look around and check out the numbers on that too. <coughs> Wonderful. And, and a final uh, question for our survey here. Um, how many of you have an innate musical ability? Now, I beg to differ. <laughs> Current research is indicating that all humans are born with innate musical capacity. And we're not entirely sure why that is. To uh, address that question, let's go back a few years. I imagine that you realize that um, music is um, always attached to human activity. And indeed, wherever there is evidence of uh, human life, there is also evidence of musical activity. Uh, so just last year, this flute that had been discovered in 2009 uh, underwent uh, another series of testing, radiocarbon testing, and uh, last year anthropologists pronounced this bone now the uh, official oldest instrument uh, known to us uh, thus far. And they're placing the date of this flute at about, as you see here, 42,000 to uh, 43,000 years old. Now, this instrument and others that are very similar to it that have been found in other areas of the world uh, indicate clearly an interest in music, that is to say, an organized sound. The holes are arranged such that uh, a certain array of pitches is possible, and only that array of pitches. An array of pitches used as the vocabulary of a composition is a musical scale. And so we have a sense of the musical scale that was used by the person or persons who played this particular instrument. We have no idea in what capacity this instrument would have been used but it clearly was used to make music, again, because of the uh, arrangement uh, of uh, the holes that allow for, for different pitches. It's entirely possible that this flute was used simply to play a song that people enjoyed. It's also entirely possible, and I would say perhaps more likely, that this instrument was used uh, by a healer. Uh, music and medicine have indeed been inextricably intertwined throughout human history. And as I'm sure you realize, in indigenous and um, uh, traditional uh, cultures, people who are called upon as healers have always incorporated music in their healing rituals. Um, anthropologists have not yet found evidence of a group of people uh, who have selected a person as the healer who has not used music in that practice. Uh, the earliest practice that we know of uh, is from the Aboriginal people in <coughs> Australia, and the instrument that they used is still in use today, the didgeridoo, except in ancient times it apparently was known as a yidaki, and uh, that instrument was used uh, by the medicine men uh, uh, among the people. And the thought was that the sounds would heal. Some anthropologists have said that there's some evidence to indicate that the thinking was the sound was intended to make whatever uh, um, uh, applications the medicine person had already practiced be effective. That is to say, the sound was in order to affect the medicine and to make the medicine effective. And uh, we've actually seen uh, that intent in cultures outside Australia. Uh, we know that in uh, Australia, the tradition had been with the didgeridoo to heal uh, torn muscle and even to uh, set broken bones. And so we're seeing an application of music as medicine uh, that is in addition to the therapeutic function uh, of just listening to music, but in a, in a function that is perhaps uh, more concrete. Um, uh, one of my favorite uh, neuroscientists today, Isabel Peretz, uh, has said this, I'm quoting her, 
Music has emerged spontaneously and in parallel in all known human societies. Although we do not know when music emerged because there are no fossil records of singing, archaeological evidence shows a continuous record of musical instruments. And again, we have uh, instruments then dating back to at least 42,000 years old. The uh, use of the didgeridoo in Australia is estimated to be at about 40,000 years old. And then we have a host of other instruments that are, are newer, more recent, in uh, more recent use. Uh, so the research that uh, uh, scholars such as Isabel Peretz, whom I just quoted, uh, and others have produced, would say that in uh, the question I asked you a moment ago, of how many of you feel you have an innate musical capacity, is that each human is indeed born with a music capacity. And there is some difficulty in teasing apart from that evidence to what degree we have nature versus nurture. Um, but it is clear that when babies are born, they have aptitude for pitch and rhythm uh, uh, to a degree that it then is lost as they grow older, unless it's cultivated right from childhood. And so I will uh, encourage you at this point to um, make use of your innate abilities if you have not done that by this, by this time in your life. Um, especially those of you who are in uh, the medical profession, you will benefit personally from involvement in music because it does affect function of the brain. And you can be a more effective healthcare provider by incorporating music in your life. Uh, many surgeons feel that in playing a musical instrument, they maintain dexterity in their fingers and hands. Uh, Claudius Conrad, a surgeon at Harvard University and a great scholar, is also a magnificent pianist, and he uh, maintains that uh, his active practice of the piano every day allows him to be more responsive to tissue uh, when he's in uh, surgery and uh, that it allows him to perform surgeries uh, more effectively. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, consider taking up that instrument that you dropped when, when you were younger and, and your mother didn't want you to stop taking lessons, but to uh, pick that up again and put that to use. Uh, staying with our, our uh, notion of ancient music, I want to point out that in ancient Egypt, uh, there are uh, accounts that are given to us by way of drawings, the hieroglyphs, uh, that show priestesses playing particular instruments, sort of rattle-type instruments called sistra. And uh, a, a, a group of anthropologists has posited that uh, those instruments were used because they have a very complex pattern of frequencies. Uh, symbols uh, are, are fascinating instruments to study in terms of the profile of their sound because the overtones that are attached to uh, the fundamental sound that we hear when a symbol is struck uh, are extremely vast and complex. And uh, uh, many people feel that the frequencies produced by uh, such types of idiophones, gongs, and the sistra that uh, priestesses were seen to play in Egypt, uh, may have been used anciently uh, to um, uh, line up the frequencies of the body uh, with uh, what was deemed to be ideal health and indeed the frequencies of God. And so that takes us to uh, the ancient Greeks. And uh, let me advance here. Here, one moment. Oops. So, music has uh, does exist wherever humans exist, and I think I have just put this slide out of order here. Uh, humans are indeed born with innate uh, musical capacity, and I'm going to uh, skip here. Maybe. Best not. 
I, I will I will invite you to imagine a picture of Pythagoras in front of you. I'll probably we'll get to him shortly. In ancient in ancient Greece, uh, we know from the writings of Pythagoras's followers, uh, he never wrote anything himself. Like Jesus Christ, it was his fathers, uh, his followers who kept track of his teachings and ideas, and to what degree he was involved in all of those, we're not entirely sure. But we do know from those who wrote about Pythagorean teachings that uh, the belief was that there are certain frequencies uh, in which God takes a certain pleasure, and that those frequencies govern the operations of the human body. Pythagoras is known to have discovered the law of the octave, he took a wooden board and stretched a string across it, attached it at both ends, plucked it, and observed how sound is produced. And so in skipping ahead to, I'll just pull this up quickly if I might. Let me get to this spot here, excuse me. Uh, when we activate some type of body, a string or a column of air, Say we've got a string there at the bottom of the slide. If we pluck it, as Pythagoras did, and as we do when we play a piano or, or the violin or any other string instrument, or if we blow into a trumpet or flute which produces a column of air, uh, that body will vibrate as a whole and then divide itself exactly into halves and in thirds and fourths and fifths and so on. This is just simply a property of our physical universe, and it is indeed a phenomenon. And so for each of those subsequent partials of the string or column of air that vibrate, a separate pitch of sound is produced, and these are called overtones or partials. And uh, the sounds then that we hear when we think we're hearing just one fundamental pitch, the key we strike on the piano, the note we play on the violin, those sounds actually are a combination of many pitches. And uh, Pythagoras and his followers discovered this, they measured the frequencies, and they determined that these initial divisions of a string or column of air represent the ratios that God finds most pleasing. Uh, they are simple mathematic proportions. And their theory was that the human body has its systems functioning relative to each other according to these simple uh, proportions. Here's a different uh, expression of this same concept. This is simply how sound works. If we were to play the note that you see on the left, and I know that many of you read music, uh, if we were just to play that one note, what we actually hear are all of the notes that you see on the right. Uh, that array of pitches, and actually more, higher than what I've got notated here, are the harmonics, or the partials. These are the overtones that we hear above a fundamental tone. And uh, so in the example of the sistra played by priestesses in ancient Egypt, gongs that have been played by uh, many cultures around the world, primarily in Asia. Uh, we have in those particular instruments an especially rich presence of overtones, harmonics. We have a set of overtones with every sound we hear, but in certain instruments and voices, the overtones are much more prominent than in other instruments and voices. It is the array of overtones that allows us to determine one friend's voice from another friend's voice. Or when we are hearing exactly the same frequency, exactly the same rate of vibration from, say, a piano and a saxophone, we can tell the difference between those two instruments because of the array of the overtones. Some of them will be stronger, some of them will be weaker. In the idiophones, such as the gongs and sistra, uh, uh, just the use of uh, metal in that type of design for making sound produces overtones that are especially prominent sort of across the board. And so the belief is that with all of those frequencies, uh, many systems of the body will then resonate and respond. And so those uh, uh, types of instruments were used as sort of all-purpose healing 
whatever might be ailing you could be addressed by this rich array of, of frequencies and bring your body back into alignment. So uh, Pythagoras, the ancient Greeks, and many mathematicians and uh, uh, physicians after their time maintained then that, that these primary intervals are those that, again, God liked best. These are the intervals that represent uh, simple mathematics and divine proportions. And if, if our bodies are ill and have some type of disease, if the frequencies are restored to a common resonance with, with uh, pure mathematics and, and with a divine order, then our bodies will be healed. Uh, this belief, this concept obtained in the West especially for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, uh, many, again, as I said, mathematicians, scientists, physicians, uh, took up this idea and tried to prove it, to examine whether it, it really could be uh, viable. I'll just show you a diagram of, of just one uh, such scholar. This is Robert Flood, a scientist, as you see here, from the 17th century. And uh, he demonstrated uh, his own version of Pythagoras's monochord. And in this lovely drawing, uh, he shows our entire solar system as being an instrument tuned by God. And so we have the sun at the center, and then we have the other heavenly bodies and planets arrayed, and those arching sort of circular lines are indicating frequencies as well as orbits. And, uh, and we see then the, the hand of God coming down to tune uh, our system, to tune our reality as, as human beings and in our physical universe. And uh, uh, the letters that you see written up and down the monochord are, of course, A through G. Those are the letters that are used in the West to represent particular pitches. And uh, so the belief going back to ancient Greece and being maintained through the 17th century and even beyond uh, was one of uh, being in proper resonation with a divine order, with some type of perfect mathematical equation. And uh, uh, there may be something to that thinking uh, in the sense that uh, sound, we now know, does affect how we feel. Sound can affect how our brains function. And so part of my message today is that the companionship that music and medicine have had throughout human history, uh, I think now is especially ripe for a rejuvenation and for uh, uh, an assessment uh, that might be counter to what um, our scientific uh, uh, minds may tell us. Uh, often in, in the research I do, I'll come across material that, that frankly, is not only uh, fluffy, but somewhat questionable. And I'll find myself reading research that, that sounds a, a little weird. And, uh, and, and I'm here to tell you that the studies that uh, are being done um, uh, by uh, neuroscientists in, in the field are of pure science. And we have hard data that is showing that uh, sound does have some type of function in our bodies uh, that can indeed alleviate pain and perhaps even rebuild tissue. It certainly can uh, change the function of our brains. And uh, particularly when we're engaged actively in music, both hemispheres of the brain are involved, and we see that in the brains of active musicians, the corpus callosum is stronger and larger, and other areas of the brain are more routinely involved that are rarely involved uh, in the brains of people who are not that actively engaged in music. Uh, so uh, there is something to the notion that has been carried for centuries and centuries as to the healing properties of, of sound in our bodies. I'm going to 
flip out of here and jump down here then. Uh, in this slide, we can see the regions of the brain that are activated uh, when we are involved in listening to music. And uh, that might be a bit difficult for you to see, but different areas of the brain process different musical materials. It was thought for a while that uh, music was confined to one area of the brain, but uh, now owing to MRI technology, uh, we can see that uh, many regions of the brain are activated um, by music. And uh, there appear to be perhaps a couple of uh, zones in the brain that are music specific. Uh, nevertheless, uh, both hemispheres are actively involved. And uh, I have uh, um, put together a, a variety of studies that would indicate that when one is performing music, one is using the brain in uh, a way that I, I don't know of any other activity uh, that equals uh, uh, the uh, powers that we call upon when we're performing. Uh, when a musician performs, he or she is drawing upon all of these regions but then uh, additional areas as well in uh, picking up on emotional cues from the audience, in trying to control one's nerves, in, in managing the body as one performs, uh, and of course in remembering the music, but whenever one thinks of a particular piece of music, one can't help but have a flood of memories uh, flow in, and when a musician is performing, he or she has to sort out just this array of uh, thought and memory that will be swimming around in the brain and to control all of these. And a musician has to be sure to, to get these notes right, however he or she has practiced them. And uh, so there's great uh, physical dexterity and uh, physical <coughs> tests involved. And then the whole range of artistry that comes into play for a musician, which draws upon entirely other functions of the brain. So performing music is very good for you. So in addition to returning to that instrument, you may have, have discarded a while ago or you've left off uh, playing when, when you got too busy, you might now return to some type of performance in your life. It's very good for you. It can be nerve-wracking but it's great for your brain, so just tell yourself that and, 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 and get on with it. Uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, exhibit, we see here um, uh, activations of a brain of a musician uh, who is improvising in jazz. Uh, jazz musicians are the, the musicians supreme. And as you likely know, in jazz, improvisation is mandatory, and uh, it used to be mandatory in classical music until the 20th century with recorded sound that really put an end to improvisation in, in classical music. Uh, in jazz, uh, improvisation is, is, is the heartbeat, if you will, and so uh, uh, as uh, a performer is improvising, uh, we, the person has, of course, all of the features of performance that I just referred to a moment ago, and then the activity of creating music. And in jazz, uh, typically, uh, the performer is creating new music based on a pre-existing tune or harmonic progression. And so the, the level of creativity is extremely high. The person's brain is referencing pre-existing material, but then determining new patterns uh, to build on top of that material. And, and doing this at, you know, as, as uh, performing in a, in a split second of, of thought. Uh, and so jazz musicians have uh, extremely active brains. Uh, in this array of images, we have in the, the column A on the left, uh, non-musicians listening to a particular piece of music, and in the column B, musicians listening to that same piece of music. In column C, uh, musicians listening to uh, a certain series of rhythms, 
and column D, non-musicians listening to the same series of rhythms. These images alone should convince uh, uh, any publicly elected lawmakers to make music education mandatory and prominent in our public schools. Uh, evidence is uh, irrefutable at this point that, again, engagement in music strengthens the brain. And uh, it seems that music really is not that optional activity uh, that uh, it has become in, in, in the last century or so. Within this last century, music therapy uh, developed as a discipline. And uh, it seems that uh, uh, since the time of about Robert Flood, 17th century, uh, using music as medicine uh, moved into a period of decline. Uh, there were always some people involved in uh, examining these notions of resonation and, and using music to heal the body. And, and as I said casually a few minutes ago, sometimes some of that literature gets to be a, a, a bit of a, 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 an interesting experience to read. I mean, you can read some of the writings of um, uh, experiments that have been undertaken and, and, and just be glad that that's not somebody in your family who did that. There are some, there are some odd things that have gone on in, in the name of uh, identifying the power of music. But we're glad that somebody has gone to that edge, moving further in uh, to the edge of um, uh, better science and, and uh, reliable science. Um, music therapy uh, resurfaced uh, mid 20th century and especially then by the end of the 20th century and it has become a, a field uh, gradually being accepted uh, by major universities in the United States and Europe who are now offering degrees in music therapy and uh, the primary uh, purpose of uh, music therapy then according to the academic system today is for uh, persons to be uh, with patients in a one-to-one -one situation to make music with and for the patient. And uh, uh, if you've ever seen a music therapist in action, uh, you, I, I think, will have noticed there is wonderful communication between the therapist and the patient. You had a glimpse of that in the footage with Gabby Giffords. Uh, a music therapist must be a very sensitive and committed person. And as people in the medical field, uh, you know who you are. And you know when you can have a special influence on people. And I encourage you to be mindful of the influence you can have, especially if music is involved. Uh, it's a wonderful career and one that certainly is extremely meaningful. We can never have enough music therapists, however. Uh, would that we could provide a music therapist for virtually every patient in, in a hospital bed, uh, especially those suffering with extremely painful diseases. Uh, so music therapy is growing. I don't think it has been growing quickly enough. And <coughs> I think we still are coming up against some reluctance uh, in the academy and uh, perhaps owing to pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies to accept uh, music as a viable form of treating illness. Uh, so in music therapy, uh, uh, a therapist will work with a patient primarily to uh, teach that patient to use music for himself or herself as a means of combating pain, or as a means of restoring uh, language abilities, as we saw with Gammy Giffords. The work that music therapists have done just since the late 20th century, though, has shown that much more can be accomplished in this one-to-one -one setting of music therapist with a patient. And so now, recently, uh, music therapists have been working with diabetic people 
and uh, showing people who struggle with diabetes how to use music to lower blood pressure, to keep their systems under control, and to uh, ideally have uh, less of a need for insulin injections than they've had previously. Uh, this, as you might realize, is extremely meaningful for people with diabetes. Uh, to be able to go with less medication uh, is, is an optimum situation. Several studies are indicating that on the topic of pain alone, uh, many patients can go with less uh, medication that addresses pain if music is involved. And so I'm sure we all agree the less that we need to administer uh, pain medication to people, uh, the better. Uh, there is even a study that I just learned of that is examining the possibilities of uh, music therapy for helping people with dyslexia. It appears that dyslexia really is a matter of timing in the brain. And that as the brain is uh, observing letters and numbers, it's really a question of timing, how the brain is receiving them. And uh, so music as an event that occurs over time, that requires time, is being used to help people uh, work on the timing uh, functions of, of their brain and to then overcome dyslexia. Uh, so there are a variety of applications that I think a lot of people don't know about uh, that are possible for music and that have been discovered through uh, the traditional music therapists, uh, again, who especially became uh, prominent in, in the late 20th century. Um, I think it's important for uh, uh, doctors to realize then that where music therapists can be called upon to uh, help their patients, doctors themselves uh, may be able to put music to work in their practices. Uh, Dr. Childress mentioned from the waiting room to the recovery room, music often is present. And I encourage doctors to take note of how music is used. In the waiting room, uh, music can dramatically affect how a patient feels as he or she is waiting. And specific types of music uh, can elicit specific types of emotion. Uh, this is something that also goes back to the ancient Greeks, who knew that if you listen to uh, music written in particular scales, you would have particular feelings emerge. Music has been known to imitate human emotions. And this is why, as I said earlier, when we're sad, we often then listen to sad music. We know that music resonates with our emotions. And so if we want patients in a waiting room to be calm, to feel at ease, there are particular kinds of music that can serve uh, those purposes. And uh, so I'm recommending to doctors to uh, be mindful of this and to uh, call upon musicians who can find for them music that, for example, uh, is not a fast paced, music that has a slower harmonic rate, that means the harmonies don't change uh, very quickly, harmonies are rather static, music that uh, does not have a strong rhythmic profile, and indeed, we might even want to draw upon music that is non-pulsatile altogether, such as Gregorian chant, a type of music that's familiar to many people. Uh, this is music that helps the mind then just kind of float, and we don't feel pressured by time, and we're not hearing a lot of dissonance because we don't hear harmony in uh, Gregorian chant. So there are specific types of music that can be used in the waiting room to allow patients to just be calm and feel <coughs> comfortable. Needless to say, perhaps, uh, those same effects can uh, uh, be for the loved ones as well, those who are waiting uh, with people uh, in, in the waiting room. Uh, uh, many doctors are finding that they prefer to use music uh, as uh, in conducting surgery but I'll ask doctors to consider the questions. Do we want music for the patient, music for the staff, or music for the surgeon in the operating room? It's becoming common for a patient to have an MP3 player 
and to be able to choose his or her music or have his or her favorite music already loaded up. And this is uh, showing uh, excellent results in terms of people being calm and feeling comfortable before and after surgery. So in the operating room, if uh, the patient is listening to his or her own selected music, uh, then perhaps the, the surgeon and staff uh, can, be, can be free to listen to music. But there are some reports, and there, they are not many in number. Uh, they're showing some uh, um, uh, results that are somewhat contradictory. But some uh, studies are indicating that the surgical staff might not like the music that the surgeon prefers, and a member of the staff then is uncomfortable or irritated. And obviously, that's not going to have uh, a good outcome. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, citing Claudius Conrad again, he now uh, practices with uh, the staff that will serve with him in surgery a, a pre-operative ritual of listening to some music together. And then they sort of uh, get aligned with a similar kind of mood and, and uh, resonance frequency, if you will, before they go into surgery. And he has said that this has made a tremendous difference in the effectiveness of the surgical team. They're, they're kind of in line and, and again sort of in a common resonation uh, before they, they go into the surgery. Uh, on the other hand, the surgeon may find that listening to, say, Baroque music, which has a fast harmonic rate, the harmonies change virtually every beat, and uh, especially a fast-paced piece from the Baroque style can help with uh, the focus that's necessary for surgery and can help the surgeon work more quickly. And there are some studies that, that indicate that this is the case. Um, uh, and so when I mentioned music that might help you with house cleaning, this is that type of music. The music of the Baroque style typically has just one affect, one mood throughout a given movement. And so if the movement begins fast, it's going to stay fast. And there is a motoric drive in music of the Baroque style that, that is very helpful uh, for staying focused and, and on task. This can be useful when children are working on homework. Uh, different effects then will come from different styles of music, music that are in different tempi, and that have uh, different rates of change of harmony. Uh, uh, in in post-op, again, I think it's important uh, for the patient to uh, have music that uh, brings some sense of comfort and stability. So I uh, uh, ask uh, you in the profession to draw upon the knowledge that uh, musicians have of repertoire uh, so that they can direct you to music that has certain features that will allow you to uh, serve the needs of your patients. Uh, there's a, a practice uh, of uh, making sound visible that uh, has uh, become of interest to a, a variety of people. And uh, this is just the type of machine that they use. All you are doing is uh, bringing vibration to a surface. And if you see here, these are designs that are produced just by playing individual notes on a piano. This is what sound looks like. These designs just naturally occur when a surface is made to vibrate. And in this case, again, a, a, a note on the piano has been played. And so, in conclusion, I want to have you just uh, uh, see this at work. Uh, this is just a dish of water that is uh, being made to vibrate, and Dish you'll see what happens. It's vibrating with a low frequency sine wave. As the volume is increased, the circular ripples transform into a dynamic pattern with five-fold symmetry. To appreciate the intricacies of this patterning fully, the footage can be slowed down. And the waveform viewed from above. And 
so, ladies and gentlemen, this is what sound looks like just when it's put into motion. I wonder if we might take fuller advantage of what sound might do when it puts areas of our bodies into motion. And so I'm encouraging a stronger affiliation of music and medicine here at the beginning of the 21st century. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for some questions and comments. I'd also like to apologize for the disorganized sound that was going on uh, in the construction site at the back. Um, but if you have a question or comment, if you'd like to uh, offer that now and uh, identify yourself as well. Hi, I'm Phil Scott Shiras. I'm a clinical psychologist. And I was thinking of so many other uh, venues and ways that the music could be used as you were talking and wondering if there has been research, for example, during childbirth and um, you know, MRI, uh, things like that, and whether there's been research in allowing the patient to choose the music in addition to the... Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for asking that. There are many studies uh, that are indicating across the board favorable outcomes when patients are given the opportunity to choose music. First of all, to listen to music and then to choose the music they listen to. Positive uh, applications, again, across the board and in childbirth without question. Uh, uh, so this is, a, uh, that is a definite, yes, it's been tested, and yes, it has positive effects. Yeah, and the MRI too, when you're going through And an MRI, absolutely. Yes, uh, I would be interested in having uh, the companies that produce the technology used in uh, hospital rooms. To, it would be easy enough to make the sounds be different. And uh, I think that's something that could be addressed. Yes, um, i a question. Who are you? Um, this is uh, Chaplain Gerard. Um, do you make a distinction between secular music or, or Christian music when you talk about uh, uh, music you can be healing to um, certain type of music? No, but it's a fascinating question. And, and no, I don't. I do know that uh, people who um, are people of faith are especially moved by music that has been intended uh, to be worshipful. And so for patients, that could be especially helpful to make available to them music that, if you will, resonates with their worship. Absolutely. Other questions? Good afternoon. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm actually, like you, a professional musician, not a medical professional. And I'm curious, I've seen some studies that show, you know, when they, for example, do the mice, do the maze better with Mozart, and then they do that better with the Beatles, but not as well as they do with Mozart, and then sometimes with certain music they start fighting. Uh, are you, are you, are you, uh, just following up on what you talked about at the end of your talk, willing to make certain kind of distinctions between some music being preferable, at least certain situations? Yes. Because uh, that seems to me a fascinating thing, but as you know, people in our field are very hesitant to, to make these kind of distinctions sometimes. Right, and yes, I am prepared to do that, and what I'm prepared to say is, it's whatever music the rats or your patients prefer to listen to. <laughs> and this actually is, is now a matter of scientific proof. Uh, the Mozart effect is nice for people who like Mozart, but the Beatles effect is just as effective for people who love the Beatles. It's whatever music the person enjoys. One last quick question. Hello, I'm Ann Taylor, and I'm a professor of nursing. And this is more of a comment than it is a question. But I thought maybe that it would be helpful for others in the audience here to know that for the past two decades, in a course that I teach in the School of Nursing, nurses and others from other schools and departments here have had some attention brought to the use of music within um, Healthcare, particularly, we, we approach it from the 
vantage point of talking about complementary health enhancing strategies or approaches. And there's been research in, in the nursing profession where we have shown that in critical care units, and particularly coronary care units, we can bring down patients' blood pressure, heart rate, etc., simply through the use of music. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a lovely presentation. Thank you. And so, yes, we do see that music and medicine work well. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time, but I'm hoping that this presentation has prompted you to think a lot about the music that you like to listen to, um, but also to think about incorporating music into your practice of whatever your profession is um, in terms of, of increasing productivity, enjoyment, other things like that. And that you perhaps will think about also the role that music has in your life. I know one of the things I'll take away from this is thinking about why my mother cleaned house to honky tonk piano. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like you to come back next week. We have uh, author, physician author Lisa Sanders here to talk about every patient tells a story. Um, and we'll see you then. Thank you.